so Ben Dichter is going to talk about um, NWB extension. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ben Dichter. I'm going to talk about an NWB extension for storing results of large-scale neural network simulations. This is work I did out of Ivan Scholtes' lab, um, and, but it's actually a collaboration between a bunch of different groups, um, people from his lab as well as the Allen Institute. Um, I've been working closely with people from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and with Kitware to help with this. Um, so quickly, just to explain what Neural Data Without Borders is, it's a data standard that's trying to unify data format across labs that are collecting electrophysiology and optical physiology data. Um, so the way this works is I think of it as kind of a hierarchy where at the bottom you have um, data storage rules. So this says things like if you store local field potential data, you have to also store the sampling rate and what the units of that data are. And you have to store what electrodes recorded that data. And then if you store electrodes, you have to store what the positions of those electrodes are. So you end up with this kind of data dependency tree that um, it's, it's very, I mean, if, if you're a theorist and you're usually getting data from other labs, you know how hard it can be to understand someone else's data structure. So the idea is to establish a set of rules that we need when we're transporting data from, from one person to another and so that we can archive data. So this ends up being a pretty complicated set of rules. So we're building um, PyNWB and MATNWB, um, which are tools in Python and MATLAB to help us bring data from various formats into uh, Neurodata Without Borders. And then once we have data in this format, we can use the I.O. tools in Python and MATLAB to help us efficiently build visualization and analysis tools that will then be generalizable across these labs. Um, so this will enable collaborative neuroscience, um, data archiving, sharing, tool sharing, reproducibility. You guys are here at Neuroinformatics, so I think you're all on board with that, so I'm just going to move on. Um, so the, the core of NWB is really focusing on EFIS and OFIS. Um, but I'm going to talk to you now about how I'm using the extension framework to actually expand upon the scope of the format to store simulation data. And here I'm really um, focusing on, on a new types of data that allow us to store really um, the incredibly large volumes of data that are the results of simulation. Okay, so I'm working with two groups. Um, one is actually Yvonne's group. Um, they are simulating a million or more neurons with realistic cell type, connectivity, dendrite morphology, and synaptic integration with the goal of understanding how spatial memory works. Um, the technology is they're using neuron um, in Python with mesh patching interface on high performance computers with parallel HDF5. If this, if this uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to you, it's fine. It's just a bunch of jargon. It doesn't mean anything at all. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the output data is generally what you would sensibly want from the output of a simulation. Um, similar to electrophysiology, you would want the spike times. Um, but you would also, you have the ability to record um, intracellular and extracellular continuous variables like membrane potentials and calcium concentrations. Um, and you, this simulation at this scale um, allows you to have both very large scale recording from many neurons at once, but also very detailed information about specific neurons if you're interested in specific com how specific compartments behave of individual cells. Um, so which results in a very large amount of data. So um, if you went to Yvonne's talk yesterday, you know that this is a really um, impressive project, and you also know that this slide is a really bad summary of that project. So um, I hope you were able to um, attend his talk, but um, we don't have time to go into the details of, of the goals of the project themselves. I'm going to focus on how to store the output. Um, and so I'm going to do an equally bad job of explaining the Allen Institute um, simulation effort of, um, of trying to simulate um, in vivo-like conditions for um, understanding visual scenes. Um, so what actually, uh, the two groups started this effort apart from each other, but settled on very similar technology. So in red here, I don't know if you can see, in red is different, but the black is all stayed the same. Because it's actually, they're both using Neuron, Python, MPI, high performance computers with parallel HDO5. And the output data is essentially the same for the, both labs. So um, we discovered this and about each other, and we decided, well, let's team up and try to figure out if we can um, f establish a, um, an output format so that our, the tools that we build are compatible with each other. 
So um, the goals for these tools are going to be, again, we need to store spike times and we need to store continuous data, um, like membrane potential and calcium concentration. Um, and the requirements of this is that it needs to scale very well to a very large number of cells. It needs to enable efficient parallel read-write. And we'd really like it to be compatible with each other, as, with other groups as much as possible, and with experimentally derived data as well. Okay, so here's the structure that we settled on for spike times. Um, we have a, a cell ID, which has a one-to-one -one relationship with a range reference matrix, and that range reference points to the spike times. So this, this, these three arrays actually hold information for every single cell. So no matter how many cells you record from, the number of arrays does not scale with the number of cells, and that's really essential here, because that allows us to scale to a million neurons with only three arrays defining all of the spike times. So here, for, to just illustrate it, for the, the blue entries, that's cell of cell ID zero, um, which maps to spike times zero through five, and then you just look that up on the spike times array, and that gives you um, entries zero through five of spike times. And so this allows you to have a different number of spike times for each cell, and you can just add to this um, as much as you want. Um, this, so it, it scales to a large number of cells because you only have three arrays, um, and it allows for efficient parallel read-write um, one of the ways that we do that is we have this cell ID array, which might seem redundant because it's just counting up, but this actually allows you to write the data um, out of order. So if you have cores that are, um, that are representing different cells and you don't know which core is going to end first, you know, this could have been one and then zero. It doesn't have to be zero and then one because then we can go back and look at the order and say, oh, okay, they were written out of order. Okay, so, um, so I, I should say that this solution um, is very, is, is heavily inspired by work that was done in the Schultes lab before I, I came into the lab. Um, my work has really been writing an extension to NWB to port this technology into NeuroData Without Borders. Um, and so, uh, and the, the other thing we need to do is store continuous data. So here we're gonna use a similar strategy where we've got the cell ID and an index pointer. And this index pointer is actually gonna map to compartment IDs which are physical locations of cells. So uh, similar to spike times, uh, if you're marking physical locations of cells, you want to have the ability to mark a different number of physical locations per cell. So we have the same kind of lookup strategy where um, the index pointer maps to compartment IDs, which give you um, the physical locations within compartments. And then um, once we have those compartments labeled, we can use a, a just a standard matrix time series where this is time um, by the number of cells times the number of compartments, the average number of compartments. Um, and the, the way this is kind of integrated into NeuroData Without Borders, just to kind of give you a, a taste of, of how this works, this is like a, it's an object-oriented way of storing data. So this time series object inherits um, from, a ti from time series measurement type, which means all of these attributes are gonna be a requirement to store this data. You need to say the name, which is basically what it is, like is this membrane potential, um, the source, the sampling rate, the starting time, the unit, the conversion, and the resolution. And so those are the essential meta metadata that you need in order to analyze or understand a time series. Um, so again, uh, this uh, scales up to many neurons because we have uh, five arrays here, and that allows us to fit data from any number of cells. Um, and it allows for parallel read-write because you can write this out of order if you need to. Um, this is heavily inspired by the, um, the structures that are already in Neuron, and it's specifically um, designed to be compatible with Sonata, which is a format that the Allen Institute has already been establishing with BlueBrain. So the idea here is we can, we can build extensions in NWB with a explicit goal of being very easily interoperable with other formats. We don't necessarily need this to be the uh, simulation output format to rule them all. Uh, as much as I would like that, I recognize that's not like realistic all the time. Um, but the one advantage that this has is that it allows you to, um, to store simulation output data in a way that's um, very analogous to the way that you can store electrophysiology data, for instance. So you can um, apply minimal changes to the script, um, to the analysis script, and run an analysis on both. 
Okay, so now that we have this extension, I'm working with the NeuroData Without Borders um, core development team to establish an extension sharing framework. So um, I, I think that this extension, uh, if you notice both of, of these data types, it's not um, necessarily problems that are specific to simulation. They're actually more problems that are specific to scale um, both in both of these cases. So I think we're starting to solve problems in the data storage space specifically for simulations that are starting to become problems um, that experimentalists are having and will continue to be um, even more problems as we progress. So, um, so we want to be able to share these extensions so that anybody who needs them can use them. So um, in this extension sharing framework, it's not quite uh, ready for prime time. It hasn't been released yet, but um, what we um, what it will include is the specification itself, so the definition of these data dependencies, the code to generate it and to use it, and documentation. And um, and the idea is that this will actually it will be able to version this and um, and then feel, get community feedback, community involvement, and as a community, we can establish a um, an extension for storing simulation output data that is um, satisfies everyone's needs. Um, and this extension sharing framework, it's not just for simulation output, it's for um, opening the neuro data without borders standard in, um, in any direction that's, that's necessary for storing the, the data that your lab needs. Um, okay, so I just um, want to finish by saying um, I'm, this is basically what I do. I help labs um, bring their data into a common format. Um, and I'm really interested in talking to you if you're interested in, in leveraging this type of technology. Um, just learning more about NWB, if you want to um, convert your own data or build tools for NWB, that would be great. Like definitely talk to me if you want to do that. Um, if you want to build bridges from other standards like bids, for instance, to um, NWB, um, please find me or email me. I'll be around. I'd love to talk to you. Um, and just, I just want to thank um, Kavli and the Allen Institute for putting on this hackathon, which we took a picture of here. A lot of the collaborative work was done in this hackathon, so I really want to thank them for putting that together. Okay, thanks. Great, for keeping to time. Right, Goofy. So, um, have you looked at the published specification for NSDF? Neural simulation data format, which came out a couple, a few years ago. Um, I have not looked deeply into that. Right now, the the goal was to make this as compatible as possible with other experimental groups that we're that we're working with. But I I need to look more deeply into that format. Actually, if you're if you want to discuss it, I'd be I'd be happy to learn more about it. Okay, sure, happy to do that. The other thing was a question, which is, um, I don't understand how. Uh, by uh, staggering multiple uh, street, multiple uh, electrodes, so to speak, into one array, are you able to handle streaming data? Yeah. So streaming data is tricky. Um, so I guess so. There are there are kind of two ways of storing spike times. One is you could do it by cell, and the other is by time. If you're doing it by time, then then you're able to just append to that as much as you want. It's very easy to stream data. If you're doing it by cell, it's, it's, it's not 100% straightforward how you would stream data. Um, and so that's the weakness of, of this approach for sure. So um, it, what the design decision came down to which uh, type of thing we wanted to be more efficient to query over, whether we wanted to make it more efficient to query over uh, what cell the spike belonged to or the time region that um, and all cells of a certain time region. So we chose to make the querying most efficient over cell. Um, and the way that we, it's kind of, it's a little bit hacky, but the way we would handle streaming is we would not require the cell ID array to be unique. So you could have cell one could be in that cell array twice. So you could, you could basically have a buffer that contains, a, say, a second of data, write, write all of your cells, and then for the next second, you can have another one that has another pointer to more spike times. It's not ideal, but it is a way to handle that problem. Yeah, um, nice talk, Ben. Um, is N would you say NWB is ready for prime time? Like, would you advocate that all of the experimental labs throughout the world should start, you know, converting all of their data to NWB? Or do you think it's still, uh, you know, there's still a lot of iteration that needs to be done before we can advocate widespread adoption of NWB? I would be 
firmly in the middle between those two positions. <laughs> Um, I, I definitely wouldn't say that you should use it as a backbone of your lab today. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's really valuable for labs that are getting involved now because we're in the final stages of the malleable state where uh, we haven't quite gotten to the point where we are 100% guaranteeing backwards compatibility because we want to be flexible enough to handle um, the issues that are coming up with labs. Uh, we have a timeline which is um, the, the goal is like mid-October to, to like release an official um, thing and say we're going to support backwards compatibility from here on out. I think that's an ambitious timeline, but you know, it's, it's soon, it's coming. Um, we've been working through a ton of bugs and now it's like, it, it's, it works. It actually, I mean, I have been able to really get labs into it in a way that, that uh, works for those labs. So um, I would encourage you, if you're interested in using NWB at some point, to get involved now so that we can see what problems your lab faces and, and we are in this um, rapid development stage where we can fix those more easily because we're not guaranteeing backwards compatibility. Uh, one on right at the back. Uh, hi. I haven't worked with this type of data before, but I have worked with other data where the sampling rate is sort of a best estimate. Yeah. Um, so does NWB handle that case where yeah. your timestamps might be noisy or? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so that's a good question. Um, it, so the time series data type, it has the option of storing your times as a starting time and a rate, or you can store them as timestamps. So you must do one or the other, um, but if you have some kind of irregular sampling rate, we are totally able to support that data. have thought about um, kind of downloading data that is um, like from CRCNS database or um, what is the other that eLife uses um, and uploading them into your database is how um, does that work so so that uh, because we spend a lot of effort on um, taking other people's you know when working with other people's data and you know, understand, yeah. So it would be helpful if uh, the data sets that are already there were reprocessed somehow. Yeah, I, um, so I have had some requests from specific people who have posted data and they're like, hey, if you wouldn't mind downloading it, converting it, and putting it back up. I mean, that's something we would definitely uh, be open to. Right now, um, you know, the, the reason, the inspiration for this format in the first place was that it's so difficult to understand data sets if they're not following any kind of standard. And in my experience, you're almost guaranteed to be missing some crucial information, and then you need to have like months of communication with the experimenter in order to actually understand it. So um, the, what I'm focusing on right now is, is actually working with experimentalists as they're trying to put their data up, because now they're, they're there and they can, they can help me answer the questions. Um, I, I think it totally would be possible for some particularly well-documented data sets to do this type of thing, to download them, to convert them, and to re-upload them as, as NWB. Yeah, I mean, what we'd, what we'd ultimately like to do is, um, is to make this such a, a usable tool that when you upload data, it's, it's relatively straightforward to convert it into NWB, and we're kind of trying to tackle it from perspective just moving forward as opposed to going back through the endless archives of data. Okay, I think we should now move on. Thank you very much.